Well, welcome to Family Church. Whether you're watching Sunday morning or some other time, we are glad to be with you in your living room. Uh, We're in a very important new series called Living, and we spent several weeks on the first part of Ephesians last fall, and we talked about what Christ has done for us and what He's done in us and how we've been changed. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6 of Ephesians talks about what does that actually look like in real life? So this is the practical side of who we are becomes what we do. And it's going to be an exciting time. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Isn't it good to go to church in your pajamas? (laughs) I mean, you know, with the... Everything online and Zoom meetings and all that, it's so easy to be casual and comfortable and, you know, it's, yeah, don't just look at me that way. Some of you, admit it, if you're still in your pajamas, raise your hand. I don't care if you're by yourself. Yeah, yeah, I see a lot of you did that. It, it changes the way you feel, doesn't it? We're in a, a very important part of the book of Ephesians where he talks about how do we make this transition and this message is called Dress for Success. And it it builds on this idea that how we dress sets us up for how we live. How you dress is for what you do. And when I'm in my bathrobe, I am relaxed, I'm sipping coffee, I'm I'm reflective, I'm not active. In fact, sometimes it gets too reflective, uh, not throwing anybody under the bus, but uh, some people in our Zoom meetings are lying down with blankets or lying on a couch with a pillow And somehow your body posture and what you wear, all of that kind of affects your mindset. So Paul talks about this important picture about how we are to see the real change that God wants to bring about. Let me show you what I mean. You see, when I'm getting ready to go for exercise and go running or used to go to the gym, I dress ready for exercise. And you know, it's funny, even just putting on your gym clothes, for me at least, it makes, makes a different energy, kind of, a, I, I, I'm ready and thinking differently than I was in my bathrobe. In fact, Joseph Grenny, who is an expert on business and motivation, he, he told about a thing with his own life where he wanted to get up and jog around every morning, and, uh, and it's just so hard, the blankets are heavy, it's raining outside, it's cold, I don't want to do this, and so he, he said, I made a deal with myself. He said, I said, every morning, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to put on my gym clothes, I'm going to put on my gym shoes, I'm actually going to get to the door, open the door, and lean. And then if I really decide at that point not to go, it's okay, I'm going to give myself a pass. But the truth is, is that the, the getting up, getting dressed, getting ready, that most of the time you went. Why? Because how you dress sets you up for how you're going to live. And so this idea of dressing for a life that is full of growth and change and God wanting us to, or to being like God wants us to be, it's going to require a change in our spiritual clothes, a change in our thinking. So let me, uh, let me show you this verse, kind of right from the heart of our passage, verses 22 to 24, and, and he uses this very picture. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life before you became a follower of Jesus to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So you you see right there, he says, we're going to put off our old self, our old nature, who we were before we were a follower of Jesus, and in fact, it's something that we have to do every day because even though we are a new person in Christ, we still have those old habits and old inclinations. And he says, I want you to be made new in the attitudes of your minds. So the, the whole premise of the, this passage and the picture that he uses here is you got to take it off in order to put it on. That there's this process which is intentional. And in fact, um, some of you who've been through friend to friend, you use these terms about when you see something in your life that is not pleasing to God, you need to recognize it and replace it. It comes out of the same passage, the same idea, that I have to see what it is that God sees in me that I am blind to or that I'm caught in or that I'm still living in sin, and I need to say, okay, God, I recognize it, and now we are going to put on the new and take off the old. So how does that, why does that actually happen? And, and maybe one of the deeper questions is, why do we need it to happen? 
And, and he says here very clearly, you need to take it off because the old is corrupted. It's corrupted by its deceitful desires. That your old nature is a sneaky thing. It is inside of you as a, as a spy, as a, a counterinsurgent. And there, there is still a part of you that is being pulled back. There's a culture around you, but there is a part of you. In fact, there, there used to be a, a comedian uh, named Red Skelton. Some of you may remember him. And he had this funny sketch where he was an old hobo bum, kind of went into a doctor's office and, and the nurse said, go behind the screen and take off your clothes. And so he goes back behind there and, and he throws off a whole bunch of clothes and hangs them over the screen. And then he comes back out and he's fully dressed. And, uh, and she said, I thought you were going to take your clothes off. He said, well, I took my outside clothes off. I, I just wear those to keep my inside clothes clean. And I laughed at that, and that was kind of funny, but as I thought about it, I thought, sometimes that's what I think Christians are doing. They're, they're taking off the external, the behaviors. They're, they're trying to do more good and, and try to do fewer bad things. But think about this. <laughs> if you're wearing clothes day after day after day, it doesn't matter if they're getting dirty from the outside. You're sweating and stinking them up, and they're getting dirty from the inside. And that's what Paul says is there's a deeper problem here than, than just the culture around us. Even though the culture around us is infecting us with a, a tendency to have a, a godless perspective, he said, even if you're isolated from the world, there's still an old nature in you that you need to daily put off and put on. For example, if you go out to dinner and you get all dressed up, you wear a nice white shirt, and you know your first bite of spaghetti goes all over your shirt. Man, you can't wait to figure out a way to get home, to change that, because you feel like... It doesn't matter how good the rest of you looks. It looks like everybody is looking at that spot and thinking, man, the guy can't handle a fork. What's the matter with him? And if you see it as stained, if you see it as corrupted, you want to change it. But, but I think it maybe is even a little more tricky than that. Say, say I was to offer you this beautiful, shiny, new, fancy watch, and you think, oh, man, I want that. And I said, well, you know, it has COVID-19 germs all over it. Go ahead. You see, all of a sudden, isn't it interesting how this new awareness of viruses and germs has caused everybody to wash their hands and, and to separate and stand apart? And we're, we're doing all these things because there's this new awareness, this new thinking. And the trouble is, there's part of us that's attracted to what's wrong, the habits that we have in the past, the people around us, and even our internal old nature. But there's a danger, there's an infection. And so we need to say, God, I realize that old is corrupted. In fact, he goes on, and let me just read you these verses right up here. Uh, chapter 4, verses 17. I'll start in 17. Uh, if you have your version Bible or your Bible, just follow along. He says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. Again, very strong language. That you no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Gentiles meaning people without God, people before God. They are darkened in their understanding. They are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Man, that's, a, that's an ugly picture. He says this corruption is threefold. He says, first of all, they're ignorant. They have a wrong view of God. You know, so many people in our culture say, I'm a pretty good person, but I don't really care what God thinks. I don't care what he believes is sin. I, I'm not trying to please God. I'm not living for his glory. I just don't care. And they're ignorant because of a hardening of their heart. And then he says they're, they're insensitive because they have a wrong view of sin. You see, I, our culture says sin is self-defined. I, I will tell you, I will decide for myself if it's good or if it's bad. And it's this total out, outlook that says, I don't care what God says or what God thinks. So it's an insensitivity to sin. And it says particularly, it's like this hardening, slow process where if you do something that makes you feel guilty long enough, pretty quick it won't make you feel guilty anymore. And there's this throwing off of restraint. And he said that's the insensitivity. And then last, he says there's this sensual nature. And, and the sensual means what appeals to our senses. What, if, if it feels good, do it. And, and he goes on and he says that sensual nature is, is what is leading this charge and them trying to feel more and more of this intense feeling of good. And, and I think it's a wrong view of happiness. Uh, I believe that, that there are so many people that 
follow the butterfly of happiness until they fall over the cliff of addiction. I, I want to be happy, and it's why people get involved in so many things, and certainly it can lead to, to alcohol and drugs and, and you know, things that we would think of as clear addictions, but it leads us, and he says, he says it comes down to people are just being greedy. We can, be, we can be addicted to our stuff. We can be, be focused on our pleasure. Anything that makes me feel good, it's all about me. And he said, that old is ugly. And then he goes on, and I, I love this phrase. He says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him, with, were taught in, him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. He said, the old is corrupted. It needs to be taken off. The new is from God. That is not how you saw Jesus. That's not what Jesus did for you. That's not the new way of life. Jesus comes in, and it's not only to be the fact that, that now we get to go to heaven. It's to make a transforming. So that when I become a follower of Jesus, I become transformed by Jesus and on mission with Jesus, if you remember that triangle. So what is that transformation? It means change. Uh, speaking of change, you're probably tired of watching me in my gym clothes. Oh, that's better. At least I feel better. Maybe, maybe you feel better too. So this idea that Christ is changing us and you wonder yourself, why is it that people are Christians for so long? They're, they're 25, 30 years and Christ is supposed to be working in them and they're still cranky and they're, they're, they're irritable and hard to get along with and they're resistant to what God wants them to do and you think, why is that happening? And he says, I want you to understand that the new is from God and it has to be a process of new thinking. The old thinking was darkened and dead and it was focused on a godless world. This new thinking is about who am I, first of all? And in the first part of Ephesians, we walked through that I'm loved, I've been chosen, I'm adopted, I'm sealed, that, that all this incredible picture of Jesus dying for me and that, what an incredible life that gives me then it also is new thinking about what is truth. You see, it, it says that we are being corrupted by the deceitful desires of the old nature, the lies. Satan is a liar and our old nature is a liar. And he says, I, I want your new thinking to be aligned with God's truth, with God's perspective. And that will then give you new attitudes. Because you see, how you think, not just what you know in the back of your head, but how you are thinking really affects your behavior. And let me give you a simple example. I think almost all of us give better advice than we live. Why? When somebody asks you for advice in a situation, all those good things that you have way back in the back of your mind come to the forefront and, and you can tell them some very good stuff. In fact, I, I think that I'm a better husband when I'm doing marriage counseling because I am thinking through the things that are required to be a good husband. So, he says, I want you to have new thinking, which is going to kick up new attitudes. And we've been talking, and I don't know if it's really struck you, but how many would you say, uh, sometime these last couple of weeks, I've been thinking about this, this idea that I need to have humility and gentleness and patience. And, and boy, those are hard, especially in the situation that we're in. And being together, stuck in, we're stuck with some people way too close and separated from a lot of other people. And we just want it to be over. And I, and I found... These things are so foundational, these attitudes of our mind, and that results in a new lifestyle. And, and love, lifestyle simply means what you do consistently. Uh, it doesn't mean that you just try a new thing once in a while. It doesn't mean you, you have a new behavior when somebody's watching, which is what we tend to do. It means that this is who I really am, and it becomes a consistent part of my behavior. And so how do we get that change? How do we go from the old, darkened way of thinking and living to this new life. We're, we're in the old kingdom, the kingdom of death, and now we're in the kingdom of life. But how does that change actually happen? And there's a really important word that I, I'm not sure that we really understand the power and the meaning of. And that's the word repentance. That he says, I want you to change. And that idea of change is actually the core of repentance. And it, it involves a change in our thinking, a change in our way of seeing the world that comes when we see sin for what it really is. He said that you were, you were in your old nature, you were darkened and didn't understand and ignorant. He said, we want to see sin for what it is, and then we turn to God for forgiveness and the power to change. This is so important because 
especially if you've been in church a long time, when we start talking about change, and I'm going to mention some four specific changes, it's easy to click into, oh, I've got to try harder, I'm going to do better. And often it means when I fail, I'm going to beat myself up and, and say terrible things in my head about myself. And this is so important to know how change happens. It involves the, the Spirit's work inside of us. You see, you don't have the power to save yourself, and you do not have the power to change yourself. Isn't it interesting when we come to salvation and forgiveness of our sins, we, we think, oh man, I need Jesus for that. But when we talk about how to change, we often think, I can handle that on my own. And it doesn't work. How's it working for you? So this idea of repentance means a, a calling out to God, seeing that there needs to be a change. That's the humility. And sometimes repentance involves sorrow over sin and acknowledgement, I've really blown it. Uh, I think one of the good stories that I love about this is Craig Rochelle tells his own personal testimony. He's a, a world-famous uh, pastor and speaker at this point, but at, at that point, he was a college frat boy who was really a drunkard and involved in all kinds of sin, and one of his famous statements is, if you're not enjoying sin, you're not doing it right. And he said, I was, I was coming to the place where my life was in crisis, and I, I knew that I needed God somehow, and I, I didn't know what that even meant. And then he said, so I prayed to God that he would send me a Bible, because I knew that that might be helpful in finding God. And he said, actually, I didn't even really pray. He said, I wasn't even that far along. He said, I was walking along the campus, and I kind of thought in the direction of up. And I just love that, because I think, you know, sometimes we envision somebody praying, they're broken, they're sobbing, they're lying on the floor, they're crying out to God, please save me. And the reality is, God is there and attentive and listening. And and Craig had realized that there was a deep brokenness in him and he needed Jesus. And, and he said, I thought in the direction of up and that's all it took. He said he walked across campus and there was somebody there handing out Gideon Bibles and he said somebody gave him a Bible right at that moment and it was like, wow, this works. God's listening, God's here. And, and of course his life has been radically transformed and, and I think that's often how it works in us. Uh, I was talking to a friend about this idea of effort and trying to change and you know what he said? He said, I think really it's more like listening, that, that we need to listen to the Holy Spirit tell us what needs to change, and then we, we obey. We say, God, I can't do this, but by your help, I will. So we're going to come back to this idea of repentance, but it's really critical that I can't sit around and expect God to change me with no participation on my part. On the other hand, I can't do it myself, but I can repent, change my mind, change my thinking, and let God change me. So let me give you four specific examples of where Paul says we need to see God's change in us. He says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So he says, first area, he talked about deceitfulness of your old nature, Satan is a liar, you've got to leave that behind. And he says, to be transformed to this new normal, I want you to put off falsehood. And there's all kinds of lies. And maybe you say, well, I don't really lie. Um, I think everybody lies. You see, lying is usually for two purposes. It's either to make me look better than I really am or to cover up some failure or mistake or, or sin. And, and I want to just, again, look better than I, than I really am. And, you know, we often are not directly saying something absolutely tr untruthful. We are often just shading it and coloring it and make ourselves seem more important. And I, I think there's also lies of omission, where I just don't say anything. I'm not honest. I don't really open up and share, yeah, I blew that, or I took that, or I failed. We just hope it's not noticed, and we're lying by omission. And then uh, I think it's part of the struggle we have even in our life groups, even in our sharing times. Um, one of the rules we have in life groups is you don't fix somebody when they share. Because when somebody's finally opening up and being transparent and and being truthful about what's going on inside of them. I, I struggle with alcohol. I struggle with pornography. I'm, I'm feeling depressed. I, I'm struggling with illness or whatever it is. Man, it's so easy for people all around to go, here's what you should do and here, try this and read this book and try this diet and dogpile. And you know, as soon as somebody does that to you one time, man, you never want to do that again because our self-protection is really strong. But if we're going to have the kind of unity and love and connection, he says, I want you to speak truth and truthfully put off that falsehood. So ask yourself that question. Is this something that is in my life that I need to see differently and be absolutely truthful? 
When I give my word, it should be my bond. I, I want to follow through even if it hurts. So then he says, that's part of the new, is that you're going to quit lying and you're going to speak absolutely and only the truth. First area of change. And then secondly, he says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. And then just a couple verses later, <laughs> he may intensifies it. Get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all slander, or excuse me, all anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. You know, I think it's funny. They, they say that a language has more words about things we're more familiar with, like the Inuit language, the Eskimos. They have 11 words for snow, all kinds of different the ways in which snow is, appears. And you know, I like how he goes through it and he says, look at all these words that have to do with sinful anger. Now, now remember, anger in itself is not a sin. Um, it's just a very slippery place where you and I have a great tendency to sin. And he goes on and he, he talks about the kind of anger that's bitterness that sits inside of you and that you resent somebody. And I, I don't really even realize when I'm bitter sometimes until somebody hits that last button and that last straw. And all of a sudden, I can recount everything they have done that's hurt me in the last month. Why? Because I've been harboring that bitterness. And then he says rage, which obviously is the you know, explosive anger. And then brawling, physical anger where you're having a fight. And then slander, talking about other people, gossiping. And then he says, in case I haven't covered it yet, along with every form of malice, any kind of thing like this that's left in your heart. He says, I want you to get rid of that. That's the old. It's not like Jesus. And he says, quit this sinful anger. Instead, be kind, be forgiving. And, and he goes back to, as Christ forgave you, as Christ has been kind to you. That's the new, that's the in Christ. That's the way you're to live now. So he says, first of all, deal with truthfulness instead of lying. He said, then deal with not sinful anger. And you say, what is sinful anger? It's the kind that hangs on. It's the kind that, <laughs> it says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Great marriage advice. Um, don't, don't let it be the kind of sin that you keep walking around with. And then get, keep on this crusade to get rid of all of the anger out of your life. And then he says, third thing, stealing. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. I think this is the template, is a perfect template for the whole thing. He says, somebody who has been taking other people's stuff with their hands you're supposed to use those same hands. Now, the Bible clearly talks about restitution as a part of renewal. Uh, in every recovery program, you go back and you make things right. So this isn't just talking about now, if you stole stuff, you should give it back. No, he says this is going from way the opposite side over here where you were using your hands to steal. Now I, don't, I want you to actually work with your hands so you feel the value of it. And then I want you to give to somebody else that has a need. That, that's the opposite he says, I want you not only to no longer be somebody who takes things, I want you to be a giver, or not somebody who is stealing, but somebody who is generous. That that becomes your character, that becomes your behavior, that's your lifestyle. And there's so many ways in which we have a tendency to steal. Um, sometimes it's just manipulation, that my whole mindset is, I'm trying to get something out of this relationship, I'm trying to get you to do something for me. Uh, maybe it's a little more sinister. And I, and I would ask you to examine yourself. I don't know, a lot of you are working you know, online and you're not in your office and nobody's watching. And let me tell you, it's really easy just to start shopping or Facebooking or doing something else and you're still getting paid for those hours, but you're not giving good service for those hours. And your company doesn't own your soul, but it's bought your time. And so that is, that is theirs. And so... There are lots of subtle ways. In fact, it was a great story we talked about as we were talking about this passage, that there is somebody who, who used to use their skills on computers to pirate movies and to, to download stuff or to rent stuff and then steal it, copy it off. And now they don't do that anymore. But the opposite, now they're using their skills to help us broadcast and to help us do our audiovisual in a way that's bringing life. Isn't that a great picture? They don't just quit doing the bad stuff. By the power of the Spirit in you, do the opposite. Do something that's overwhelmingly good on the other side. And then, here's the hardest one. 
He says, don't let any unwholesome talk, get, get this word, any unwholesome talk, man, that gets me, come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You see, he says, I, I want this to be a, a huge reminder to you. And all the way through the scriptures, we get that idea that words are important. You know, what you say can never be taken back. Oh, it may be forgiven. It may, it may be graciously overlooked, but it can never be taken back. And I don't know what you think when you look at that, but I think, man, I can't do that. I, that's impossible for me. And, and I need to put every effort into calling out to God when I see that I've failed, maybe asking other people's forgiveness, but God's Spirit in me has to make me aware. He says, I want you to think not of your words as just something that's for you to get rid of, to get them out there. And there's all kinds of ways in which we have ugly words. In fact, the, the ugly words I was thinking of is partly because of the anger that we already talked about. It makes us say bad things about people. Sometimes it's cursing. Sometimes it's swearing. Sometimes it's just uh, critical. You know, last week, Pastor Will talked about that axis of speaking the truth in love, that all truth and no love is just critical. All love and no truth is just enabling. But there's this idea of encouraging and coaching and challenging that's speaking the truth in love. And again, Paul is reinforcing that our old language was part of the old kingdom. Our new language is for the new kingdom and how we should live in Christ. So he says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Our words matter so much. And there's something that I want to pass on that I, I, I read years ago, and actually I've shared it before. It's this very simple acronym. Because from the moment I think about speaking to where it actually comes out my mouth, if I can just pause, and this, this idea of think says, is it true? Well, I was talking to somebody about something they'd said, and they said, well, it was true. <laughs> That's one part of the formula. Is it helpful? That's what that verse says. Is it's good for building them up. So often I'm speaking because I just got to get this off my chest, or I'm feeling emotion, or I want to get it out. No, that's not, the, that's not the criteria in Christ's picture. It's, is it helpful for building up? Is it inspiring? Does it lead them towards good things? Is it necessary? <laughs> There's a whole lot of words that would be eliminated if we just said, does this really need to be said? And then lastly, he says, is it kind? And in the last part of this passage, he actually comes back to verse 32. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You see, the whole way of living for Christ and letting Christ live in us is to, to look like Jesus. So before you say those words, stop and think. And uh, parents, that'd be a great thing to use with your kids and maybe make a poster of that and put it up on the wall because <laughs> it might be more convicting to you than your kids, but I think it would be helpful. And then I want you to notice one more thing. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You see, he comes right back to that very thing we talked about, about repentance, is I can't change myself. Just trying harder does not work very well. He says, when you intentionally sin and the Holy Spirit saying, oh no, you said that, or you stole that, or you whatever, I can either stop right that minute and listen to the Holy Spirit, or I can just go ahead and do it because my old nature said this is what we do. And then what happens? It says it grieves the Holy Spirit. And this is one of those proofs that the Holy Spirit is a person and not a force, uh, his, his feelings can be hurt. He's a person. And it's like, it's like, guys, when you say something hurtful and it hurts your wife, maybe she doesn't even react with anger. She just pulls back. And, and here's the picture of the passage. He says that if we are intentionally sinning, we give Satan a foothold, like a beachhead, like he's got an in in our lives. And then secondly, if we continue, we grieve the Spirit of God. You know what happens? If Satan has a beachhead in your life, and the Spirit of God is pulled back in His power in your life, you're toast. You're going to be right back, probably worse than you were before. So here's, a, here's the important part of this picture, is not only do we need to be honest and say, okay, God, that's true, that's sin, that's right, and confess it, but we need to take that next step that says, God, by your Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm sorry that I took you there, I'm sorry that I did that, and would you please fill me again, because these attitudes and change that we're talking about are the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness. So we're going to take a few moments just here at the end of this service. 
you've heard a whole lot of good truth. You've been challenged to examine your heart. And I want you to use this time when, when we celebrate communion together to let God work deeply in your heart. And we're going to give you an opportunity to, to think through and to listen to the Holy Spirit. And let me just encourage you, listen and respond. Say yes, okay. And Pastor Sky and Dan are going to kind of give us a little heads up about how we're going to do this communion. Let's share this together. And now as we move into a time of communion, it's good for us to remember that communion has traditionally been a time of confession and repentance. So to bring us back to that question that Paul asked, he said, Lord, what do I need to see about my life through your eyes so I can put it off? What is it about me, Father, that you want to forgive? And as I was listening to this sermon, you know, three things that stuck out to me was, one, do I have a wrong view of God? Number two, do I have a wrong view of sin? And number three, do I have a wrong view of happiness? When I'm coming to the Lord and asking forgiveness, there's a good chance that when you first ask the question, Holy Spirit, reveal in me what you don't want there, what do I need to put off? Usually the first thing that comes to mind, it's often, the, that's, that's what it is most of the time. So I encourage you to ask this question. Now, in case you haven't met you yet, haven't met you yet my name is Sky Katie. I'm the uh, pastor of Family Churches out in South Umpqua. And Dan is one of the leading men down there. And he's going to share with us a little bit about what communion means. Communion is about remembering. We remember Christ's death on the cross for us. We remember that God's, Christ's faithfulness when we are struggling his provision, and his rescuing us. Remembering Christ's death on the cross strengthens us and also humbles us. When he died, our salvation is not based on anything that we have done, but on what Christ did on the cross. The blood represents the body, the broken body of Christ on the cross. Death on the cross is one of the most painful and humiliating deaths imaginable. The wine represents the shed blood of Christ and the new covenant. The old covenant consisted of continual sacrifices to satisfy God's justice. On the cross, Jesus took on himself all the sin of mankind, and he paid for that sin once for all. In 1 Corinthians 11.26, the last phrase says, You proclaim him the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we do. When we take this meal, when we drink the juice and we take the bread, we are proclaiming Christ's death until he comes. And wherever you're at, if you're at home, wherever you happen to be, we are doing that together. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, if you want to go grab some, some juice and some bread, or if you don't have that kind of thing, it's okay. You can use something else um, for the time being. And... Uh, as, as you get ready to do this, uh, Jordan is going to be singing a song called, Lord, I Need You. And I encourage you to take that time to ask the question, Lord, what do I need to see about my life through your eyes so I can put it off? What does it need to be, Father? God, what do you not want there? And God, what do you want me to put on? So I encourage you to do that uh, there in your homes. And Dan is going to go ahead and pray for us. God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for Christ dying on the cross. Just a horrible death. I can't imagine what it would be like and the pain and the suffering that he went through. God, we thank you that all of our sins have been dealt with once for all. And we come before you just acknowledging all you have done for us. And thank you for your love. Amen. Lord, I come I confess Bowing near I find my rest And without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you Lord, I 
sin runs deep your grace is more your grace is found is where you are and where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in me where you Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one. Defense my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes by. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need We are so glad that you have joined us here at the Family Church service, and we trust that God is using the songs and the message to somehow challenge you and to help you take spiritual steps. If you'd like to be a part of our ongoing ministry, then we believe that giving is a part of what God has given us a responsibility and a privilege that we take a first part of what he's given to us and we, we give it back to him, both as a symbol that he owns everything and we acknowledge that and also as a symbol of trust that, God, you're going to take care of me. And so there is on the webpage a place where you can give, and if you would like to be a part of what God is doing here and through this video around the world, that we would encourage you to give and trust that God will take care of you and trust that you want to be a part of what God is doing here. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you truly feel like family.